Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, a massive explosion in Lebanon shaking the ground as well as regional ties. The new IDF Coronavirus Task Force prepares to start operations. And an incredible discovery in the desert shines a light on early humanity's exodus from Africa nearly 100,000 years ago. We begin with terrible news to the north, downtown Beirut in Lebanon, covered in debris and smoke following tremendous blasts at a portside facility. A terrifying and massive blast, devastating the heart of Lebanon Tuesday evening. The shockwave and sound being felt as far as Cyprus, 240 kilometers or 150 miles away. I've seen war, I've filmed war. I went to, in 2006, I went to the South Lebanon to see this, but it took 30 days to do the same destruction. We had it in one explosion. It is a catastrophe. I've never seen something like that. The capital, Beirut, now reeling from the damages, with at least 100 people killed and nearly 4,000 injured, many still unaccounted for. Lebanese authorities not yet confirming the cause of the blast, but sources telling local media that it was sparked by a fire from welding work nearby, leading to a massive cache of explosive materials going up in mere moments. Lebanese Prime Minister Hassan Diab explaining that 2,750 tons of agricultural fertilizer, ammonium nitrate that had been stored at the portside warehouse, had ignited causing a disaster in every sense of the word. Diab's government going on to declare the coming weeks as a period of mourning in Lebanon, while releasing 100 billion Lebanese pounds, or around 66 million US dollars, for immediate use as aid, and vowing to find anyone responsible. But in the midst of an economic crisis and a global pandemic, this incident could not have come at a worse time, several hospitals themselves being affected by the blast. <laughs> Visitors, Kaza, Kaza, Aki, Ujuraha, might be killed. Kill. I can't know she meet in Jerry. Anna Beladish Kitni, Hala Bel Mustafa, Anna Tadiman Sitraf Amadiet Amtishtarin, Shagale, Ujia, Yanim Halis, Vijifoj and Levado, of Anna Belene Fe, as she Arbaham Sefeto, what on side. If you take the Muslim to a fein, Hali and Hedah will water, talking to Bikulu Mojud, Kilil Momaridin, Momaridot, Kilil Atuba. while worldwide, nations and leaders are answering the call, neighboring countries sending emergency response teams to help in any way they can, Lebanon's arch foe Israel being among them. Amidst growing security concerns between Israel and Iranian terror proxies like Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria, Lebanese and Israeli authorities both ruling out rumors of airstrikes or any Israeli involvement. Then reaching out through international channels like the UN, Jerusalem is offering to send humanitarian and medical assistance. 
The IDF adding that now is the time to transcend conflict. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin likewise offering condolences and an open helping hand. At least three Israeli hospitals also now offering to take in the wounded. Now among the Israeli hospitals offering to help with the crisis in Lebanon is the Sheva Medical Center Tel Shomer, the largest medical center in the country. Joining us with the details is Sheva's hospital international spokesperson, Steve Waltz. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, you know, why was it important for you to offer your help? Because we're the largest hospital, not just in Israel, but also in the Middle East. And uh, our CEO or Director General, uh, Professor Yitzhak Kreis, was actually the one when he was the Surgeon General of the IDF before coming to Sheba, was the one who actually built a field hospital on the border with Syria during the Syri Syrian Civil War. And even after he left that job and became the CEO or Director General of Sheba, some of the Syrian uh, people who were injured actually came to Sheba for treatment. Wow. All right. Now, were you directed in any way to offer aid to Lebanon by, by anyone, the government, for example? The government always reaches out to us, uh, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Health. Uh, we always are getting calls uh, to be on standby just in case. That doesn't mean that it will actually happen, but Sheba is already prepared for any of these eventualities because of the fact that we have something called the Israel Center for Disaster Medicine and Humanitarian Response. All right, now, so jumping off of that, you know, I understand that, as you've just said, Sheba has staff with extensive disaster management experience. You know, what can you tell us about that then? So we have a team that uh, is uh, sanctioned, not sanctioned, but actually licensed uh, by the WHO and the United Nations to jump off to any disaster zone uh, caused by human nature or other things that might happen. Uh, for instance, volcanoes in Guatemala, uh, problems in Papua New Guinea, a hurricane disaster zone in Mozambique. We have the capability of putting together teams of various sizes that can be transported within less than 24 hours uh, to any disaster zone in the world, and we can set up a field hospital to treat uh, citizens, soldiers, you name it. So are you setting up a field hospital then within Israeli borders, or are you sending one out to, to Lebanon? No, we haven't been asked to do anything uh, mm. for Lebanon. We stand at the ready to do whatever is needed. We may not even need a field hospital in this case. If uh, soldiers from the UNIFIL, from the United Nations or citizens come across the border to Lebanon, they would be treated in local hospitals. We don't need a, a field hospital in this case. And quite frankly, uh, I believe that anyone who comes across the border from Lebanon, if that happens, would probably be treated first in hospitals in the north before we get usually the patients who have the serious burns, mm. people who have tra traumatic head injuries. So we deal with the toughest patients. All right. So, you know, jumping off of that, we've all seen the very difficult images from the scene of the explosion in Lebanon in Beirut. You know, what are the primary or most frequent injuries that you see from such disasters? So after, you know, seeing that explosion, terrible explosion yesterday, the two things that would stand out would be flesh burns and traumatic uh, injuries to the head and the body. Uh, Sheba has a huge trauma center and one of the most advanced burn units uh, in the Middle East. And these are the kinds of injuries that actually were treated by Sheba from the Syrians who came across the border during the recent civil war. Wow. All right, now I know that due to the coronavirus, Sheba Tel Shomer is actually operating at nearly 100% general occupancy and over 90% occupancy in the coronavirus ward. How many COVID-19 patients are you receiving right now? Well, as of today, we have 41. That number hasn't changed in the last 24 hours, but what has changed are the following. We have more and more critically ill patients who have to be ventilated. And that's tragic. We're up to 12 ventilated uh, patients that uh, last week, half that number were being ventilated. And what's even more disturbing are the numbers of people who are walking up to our corona tent outside the emergency room. Uh, it, we're getting between 40 and 50 a day. And as far as the testing is concerned, we're finding between anywhere from 14 to 20 percent of them being positive for COVID, and that wow. is higher than the national average. Wow. All right. So 
with that in mind, you know, do you have room to take in victims from Lebanon should the spillover actually reach you? We always make room for our friends and neighbors and even those that we don't have diplomatic relations with. Sheba is blessed with the fact that it has a lot of space and we know how to manipulate our territory when needed and we are always looking to uh, have an outstretched hand to anyone in need. Makes no difference who and what they are. All right, Steve Waltz, thank you so much. Thank you. In related news, the massive explosion last night at the port of Beirut is now raising concerns back in Israel over another apparent powder keg. The petrochemical and ammonia storage facilities nestled in the port of Haifa are returning to focus. Israeli media pointing out that anyone who sees the disaster in Beirut should understand that it could happen here too. As the Haifa Bay hosts huge fuel tanks and a bromine and ammonia reservoir, the Haifa Environmental Research Center likewise is reporting that 1,500 aggregate risk areas and 800 types of dangerous chemicals lay in the Haifa Bay in factories right next to our bedrooms. While the Knesset Internal Affairs and Environmental Committee is now planning to discuss the topic, Likud MK Gila Gamliel is also calling to remove the dangerous chemicals from the bay within five years and to clean the area within five years after that. Now returning, of course, to coronavirus, Israel's newest plans for tackling the spread of the dangerous disease are coming to fruition. Nittany Manson reports. Off to a running start. Israel's COVID cabinet is set to meet again today to vote on the latest plan to address the spread of the virus. The outline drawn up by Israel's new coronavirus czar, Professor Roni Gamzu. The Gamzu says the plan will only be partial and subject to change as new data comes out. That said, it's expected to include the lifting of weekend closures of stores and malls, as well as suggestions on how to tackle the most infected communities. Another bullet point being the hiring of new state-funded doctors and nurses to handle the quickly growing caseload. Once again, at least 1,700 new infections have been recorded in Israel in the past 24 hours. The new total active cases reaching nearly 25,000, with 355 severely ill and 564 fatalities. Meanwhile, the IDF is beginning to take on its role under Professor Gamzi's new initiative. The Special Coronavirus Task Force beginning to train and send out soldiers across the country to ease pressure off of the Ministry of Health. Based in the Home Front Command Center near the city of Ramla, Army officials saying they hope to utilize their additional manpower to shorten testing times and cut the chain of infections. And set to go into full force on Thursday, August 16th, the task force has now published its operational plan, including mapping out the roles of the task force and detailing actions to stop the chain of infection. In other news, the coalition has not yet approved of a state budget and seemingly is still far away from any agreement ahead of the August 25 deadline. Meanwhile, today the Knesset will also have to discuss two bills that will once again challenge the fragile connection between the blue and white parties and the Likud party. Here to break down these issues and give us some insights is Gideon Israel, founder and president of Jerusalem Washington Center. Gideon, thank you so much for being with us today. Good to be here. All right, now, the Blue and White Party and the Likud have to evade, as I said, two threats. One is a vote on a bill to establish an inquiry commission on the uh, so-called uh, submarine affair in which ben Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is potentially involved, and also a bill promoted by the right-wing Yamina Party in the opposition that would limit the High Court's oversight capabilities over the Knesset. What can you tell us uh, about these, uh, you know, about these bills? Well, well, the well, the bill, uh, well, the bill that uh, Yamina, the the right wing party, is um, has put to vote, and it was actually voted down, would says that that the, that if a law is canceled by by the high court um, using the justification of the of the human rights constitutional law that was 30 years ago, so that so the Knesset, so the Knesset has has the option. To override the law that was that was canceled with a majority of 61 votes. Now, the law that was uh, proposed also said that if the high court wants to cancel a law, it would have to be with at least 11 judges, and you'd have to from the high court, and you'd have to have two thirds of the, those 11 judges voting to to cancel to cancel the law. Interesting. So, how how was that threatening the coalition? So this was this was a law that blue and white was um, against, and they threatened that if this, this law passed, they would go to they would go to elections. Um, the it should just be um, mentioned that in Israel, 
members of Knesset, um, at least by you know the the, the media and, and by the elites, are seen as the children, and the courts, the high court, is seen as the adults in the room. Mm -hmm. So so therefore, um, any any law to to limit the power of the of the courts is is kind of seen as a law that would um, sort of throw the adults out of the room and you know allow the children free reign. I see. So why you know. Why was the Likud... And by, by the way, that's, that, that's the way it's looked at by the left. By the right, sure. it's, a, it's a totally different story. All right, well, so with the Likud, though, be, you know, because you said the blue and white is against this bill, why was the Likud, you know, necessarily against this bill as well? Because certain members within the Likud have expressed support for this type of, of bill. Right, so the, the, the coalition chair, uh, Mickey Zohar, said that um, his position was that the Likud should support this bill, mm -hmm. and he was... Um, Oh, he, he was sorry that his position wasn't accepted, but today he said he understood that it would have led to elections, and therefore he understood why the Likud couldn't support it. I see. All right, so speaking of possibly falling back to elections, I want to go back to the budget now. Uh, how close are we to a round of fourth elections? Uh, do you think that they'll be able to pass a budget by the deadline? So, um, Ayala Shaked was, um, just said, said this morning that um, she believes one of them is going to fold either Gantz or, or, or Netanyahu. Um, but this coalition will continue to be fragile until um, power is turned over to Benny Gantz. There's always this suspicion from many that Netanyahu is looking for that exit ramp to, to get out of the coalition deal um, and any time un until, you know, Gantz becomes prime minister. Well, so who would, who would gain and who would lose if an election were called right now? So I, th I think that since people are feeling that the Likud or Netanyahu hasn't been dealing with corona as good as he might have done a few months ago, I think the, the Likud would lose seats. Um, I think also blue and white, now that they have no sort of their reason for running in the beginning was to topple Netanyahu, and now they're just a regular, a regular party. So, so I think the, the main parties that would gain would be Yair Lapid's party, a little bit of Vigdor Lieberman, and Yamina, who's uh, Bennett is seen as really, um, you know, proposing, you know, serious ideas for how to solve the corona problem, so he stands to gain also. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a big turnover that could happen if that were the case. Gideon Israel, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. With massive economic fallout resulting from the coronavirus pandemic, Israelis and Israeli authorities are looking for creative ways to get back to work. And one such plan initiated by the Israeli Antiquities Authority is now succeeding in more ways than one. Nitney Manson with the story. Incredible artifacts now unearthed. Israel Antiquities Authority excavations in Dimona discovering evidence of modern humans leaving Africa upwards of 100,000 years ago. A Middle Paleolithic flint napping or chiseling site where early Nubian mankind produced a variety of tools. בגלל שיש כאן טכנולוגיה מאוד מסוימת שאנחנו מוצאים אותה באתר הזה ולא באתרים אחרים, הטכנולוגיה של סיפוט הצור, שבעצם זה האתר הראשון הממשי שאנחנו מוצאים באותה טכנולוגיה הזאת. But beyond the amazing discoveries, the dig serves an economic function as well. Dimona is one of the most severely affected towns in Israel with respect to the coronavirus second wave. So to help at least a little financially, excavation officials reached out to residents and youth from the city to help in the project. חיפשתי עבודה דרך הבית ספר שלי, והמדריכה שלי מצאה לי את המקום הזה. פה זה האתר הראשון בארץ, שמוצאים דברים של התקופה הזאת, של האנשים האלה, אז אני יודעת את זה, וגם אני מרוויחה כסף. בחפירה מאפשרת לבני הנוער מפגש אמיתי עם הארכיאולוגיה. הזדמנות להכיר וללמוד את המורשת. יש להם אפשרות לא רק לעזור למשפחות שלהם בישראל, אלא גם לתרום לגילוי אתר עתיקות כל כך חשוב ויפה. Now for our final story tonight, you may have noticed that we are in a particularly romantic mood this week, thanks to the Jewish holiday celebrations of Tu Be'av, which ends tonight. So to understand how singles find love in Israel and among Jewish communities in the diaspora, we're joined by two experts who specialize in helping those looking for love. Say hello to international Jewish matchmaker Jessica Fass and Gali Shani Calderon, founder of Match and Maker, the method to create relationships in a short period of time. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank uh, you. Now, I want to start with the most obvious question. You know, are there differences in the way that Israelis and Jews seek love compared to other communities? Yes, I think 
I think so. Like the Israeli are um, more uh, uh, because of the things that we're going through with the army and everything. So we are more realistic mm. compared to other uh, Jewish in other places in the world. Interesting. Jessica, what's your take? How, how about, you know, Jews in the diaspora versus other communities? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning from Los Angeles. Good to see you, Gali, my business partner there. Hi. So, yeah, uh, in um, I actually think it's the same. The Jews are difficult in the diaspora, in America, in Europe, and in Israel. Uh, they're all equally picky. And sometimes you have, I deal with Americans here that really want uh, the cream of the crop Jewish partner, which is an Israeli. You know, they're looking for their Gal Gadot um, to bring over here to America. <laughs> so, all right. Now, you mentioned you mentioned actually that you got that you are business partners. How long have you known each other and have been working together? We are knowing each yes. other like for three years. Uh, some friend of mine uh, introduced me to Jessica, and then uh, like become like a match together. So you match the matchmakers. Yes, we, That's good. Yes, someone someone who was in my database, a single, and we love her. Uh, is Gali's friend, and she was our matchmaker. So we couldn't have done it without her also. Wow. All right. And so how many success stories do you have? Because you mentioned that it's a pretty difficult job matching Jews, apparently. So yeah. you know, how, how many success stories do you have? We have a lot of people that got married and, and into relationship. For us, what is important to success to be in relationship? We have also uh, 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 people that uh, got married with kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, uh, what it's like different that people even like to start their relationship is very hard for them. So to get married, it's like... Uh, That's like ultimate, yeah. ultimate accomplishment. Yeah, it's <laughs> It's the golden ticket, yeah. Um, I, I have nine marriages I'm responsible for, and one couple uh, in a serious relationship probably won't get married again. They're both 67, live here in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful story. The pandemic actually brought them closer together. Um, and some couples we're seeing are splitting up because of the pandemic, so it can go both ways. But Gali and I judge success not necessarily by the hupa but by how many thousands of dates we've set up and how much people learn about themselves. They have personal growth and self-development through going through the process with us. We both outsource to relationship therapists and coaches for our VIP clients to really wow. get a full holistic experience. It's not just about here's a match handed on a yes, silver platter. You like you need to be ready for and, and love, do the in interior work and be ready. All right, so I guess my final question is, you know, what's your winning tip for someone who is looking for love, especially now, as you mentioned, in the time of coronavirus, where people, it's particularly difficult maybe to start dating. Yeah, so what we, are, uh, what we are doing in the corona time, like we offer to the couple to start the first date in the Zoom. Because <laughs> yes, to start, but not to do it like a business uh, meeting, like to have a drink, to relax, maybe to bring a, a one of each other house, like sushi of something that the, the women like or something like that, and to do it very special. After that, we have a lot of uh, creative ideas to, to, to continue uh, in this uh, time of the corona because we, they have a lot of things to share together in this time. Maybe some of them doesn't work, maybe some of them like all yeah. the... There are all sorts yes. of things that maybe you can yes. kind of find similarities uh, in, your, in your situation. Yes. All right, well, Gali, <laughs> Jessica, I want to thank you both so much for being thank with us you. today. Uh, good luck uh, finding more matches, especially now with Tuba Av ending. Thank you so much for being Thank us. you. Thank you, Iran. <laughs> Thank you for having us. All right, now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and warm with lows dropping slightly to about 71 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow, a slight rise in temperatures back to a hot average high of 93 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 Celsius. And now, before we go, of course, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Oh, it's a cat burrito! It looks so comfortable. I kind of really wish I was that cat. Oh my gosh, I used to do that when I was a kid. So much fun. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.42 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.